Hey everyone, welcome. Today I'm going to be going through Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and trying to do some analysis to think about orchestration and composition. I think that this is a great piece to study as a composer to learn about orchestration and about composition. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing this basically for my own purposes and I'm just recording it because I thought maybe it would be useful for other people to follow along with my thought process and see exactly how I'm pulling this piece apart. I've been doing these analysis for a long time now and it just dawned on me that yeah, it might be actually very useful for other people to be able to see this and not have to go through and do it themselves. Although in general, if you want to learn something, I think that always the best approach is to go through and do the analysis yourself. You're just going to learn things way deeper and way better if you do it yourself. Taking shortcuts, reading things, that sort of thing, you can learn information, but you learn it on a much more surface level. So that's actually another reason why I want to go through and do an in-depth analysis myself. Anyways, let's jump into the Stravinsky now and start taking it apart. So right now I'm actually using, um, I'm using a Microsoft Surface Book and I found it incredibly useful because I can just write right on the screen. It has actually eliminated my need for staff paper altogether. I do nothing by like old pen and paper anymore. Everything is digitized, everything is on the computer. Uh, and this is especially helpful for score analysis, this kind of thing. Uh, anyways. I think of keynote at the beginning of this score is that Stravinsky is, is very liberal in his use of rhythms. You can see here we've got quarter note, uh, 16th notes, then triplets, then triplets, then eighth notes, and then uh, a pentuplet here. This is really interesting because it creates this sense that we're really unsure of where all the beats are, especially with the grace notes. The grace notes kind of displace things. He does have a pitch cell, so he's got, um, excuse me because that is an octave too high. My computer screen is kind of in the way. But he has this uh, these four pitches that he seems to be wanting to go through and repeat. Uh, just because of that, it, there's some sense of coherence to the melodic line, but it's all rhythmically displaced just because of how he's put together the values. The values also have this sense of kind of slowing down from 16th notes to triplets to um, eighth notes. It is worth noting here that he puts in the, uh, the notation cola parta. And what that means is follow the part. So solo ad lib, that's the bassoon part. And just because of that, everyone else is sort of following and trying to fit in with what the bassoon is playing. This brings up the second point, which is the horn part that comes in here uh, on notes that are not in the pitch collection of the initial, the initial line. The initial line has mostly E, G, B, and C. So it's sort of like a C7 chord uh, in inversion with the C at the top. So we can kind of hear that as the root. Uh, the, the horn comes in on, on a C sharp. So that's the chord that we have, which is quite peculiar to say the least. And then this kind of continues with the clarinets coming in. This one comes in on C sharp. The other one comes in on A flat. Pretty sure that's right. Transposition always gets me. Um, and then those continue uh, with uh, a lot of triplet motion, also with these grace note figures. In terms of structure for this first section, he has the bassoon solo and it's accompanied by horn very lightly at the beginning. And then the bassoon solo kind of tails off and this clarinet material that comes in underneath it, that continues all the way down into a very low clarinet range. Then the bassoon comes back in and does a very similar gesture to what it did at the beginning, although the gesture is not exactly the same. So here, it starts and then does 16th notes and then does tri triplets the first time, but this time it does eighth notes. So we have a sense that something has changed. Again, not just direct repetition. I tell my students this all the time and I try and live by this when I'm composing music these days. It's just don't directly repeat things. I, the cut and paste button is, or copy and paste button on the computer is, oh, it's a seductress. 
It just makes you, you're like, I can make a lot of music really fast by just repeating stuff. Well, you can make a lot of music fast, but the music doesn't sound very good. Um, even like a lot of pop productions that has a lot of repetition in it, they're always layering new elements in and adding new things. It's not just direct re repetitions. So really try and stay away from the whole cut and copy and paste kind of, kind of mentality. Again here, uh, Stravinsky also does a layering approach here, which is this time the clarinets arrive on this low sonority and then they continue through where before they wouldn't have. So before bassoon all by itself in the first bar and then just a single line accompanying, very simple line, only has three notes, goes up, goes back down. It's also rhythmically kind of offset so they don't feel like they're syncing up. This feels like it doesn't sync, or I guess that, yeah, they land kind of on the downbeat together then it's offset, then they land up here on the second beat together. So a little bit offset, so it doesn't sound like they're playing perfectly in time. And then same thing with the clarinets. The clarinets arrive down here, and then immediately after arriving, they have a fermata, then the bassoon takes off again and does its solo material. As it's coming to an end of its solo material or getting well established in the solo material, then the clarinets activity increases. So this is kind of a basic counterpoint thing. It's, it's easy to set something in motion. And then once, the, once you set the thing in motion, the musical idea in motion, then you can put other stuff on top of it or have other ideas happen. But you have to kind of give every idea a moment to speak before you add something else in. So Stravinsky's doing that here. Clarinets, they end on a fermata and give a moment for that sustained texture to just kind of solidify in our ear, then the bassoon comes back in and starts up with its material again. Once the bassoon material, we've, a, we've become accustomed to the fact that the bassoon is here, then he adds in the clarinets doing triplet motion, and that allows us to sort of like, re it re refreshes the texture for our ear and allows us to re-enjoy the music again in a different way. Things are being contextualized slightly differently. So this is the, what I, I kind of think of it as the second idea in this main, uh, this, so maybe if I had to do like a formal analysis, I would say this is the A section. Again, this is just rough analysis. I'm just going through really quickly. I actually haven't read any analysis papers on this, uh, on this piece. I studied it when I was like 16 or 17. Uh, and I didn't study the score, I just studied it out of a book called The Enjoyment of Music for one of my history exams that I was taking at that time. And I just studied it, so they were talking a lot about things like the revitalization of rhythm, the, the dance section that is coming up next, ostinatos, these kind of things, or ostinati. Um, I haven't gone through and pulled it apart note for note, so that's really what I'm trying to do right now. So this, I would say that this is the first section of the piece. We have a bassoon solo that repeats twice in principle. It's not a direct repetition. The bassoon solo in each case is echoed by clarinet material, which sort of does the continuation. So bassoon starts, and then as the bassoon is going, clarinets pick up and conclude the phrase. And then that same, uh, that same idea starts again here. So this is like A prime. It's like a repeat of the main idea. Now here at rehearsal two, it's actually funny because composers a lot of the time will put rehearsal marks so that they coincide with formal divides as well. So it makes the formal analysis of their pieces a little bit easier. This is sort of the second idea. Now this is an English horn, so it's a... Uh... So it's really a three pitch, three pitch class idea. Uh, if we were analyzing it, it would be uh, 025 as a set class. So it might be interesting. 025. Don't put the don't put the uh, 025. Don't don't need commas for set classes. Um, this is over top of the sustained clarinets and uh, sustained bassoon as well. So this idea kind of comes in. Uh, it's also introducing the English horn. Stravinsky, I think, is using a lot of atypical winds. So high bassoon, he's using English horn here. Then he starts eventually using alto flute, E-flat clarinet, and bass clarinet. Those five winds, just by themselves, are very atypical. Like traditional orchestra, you're going to hear flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon. 
maybe contrabassoon uh, and piccolo. Those are like the most commonly featured. Then probably after that is the English horn and then after that is also bass clarinet. But Stravinsky starts off, goes, okay, we're gonna have a high bassoon solo. Probably one of the highest bassoon pieces written to this point in history, if not the highest. Then he adds English horn as the next instrument. Then after this, he's gonna add in all these other winds that are atypical in the symphony. And I think what he's really trying to get at here is this sort of raw um, pagan quality, which he's trying to depict with this piece. So he's using atypical winds because he wants to create that sound like these are almost exotic instruments. While he's not doing what a film composer would do these days, which would just go and find some interesting instrument that isn't typically featured in the orchestra, record it and then sample it during the piece of film music. Whereas Stravinsky here is instead trying to take traditional instruments and bend them in a way which makes them sound like something that could be considered exotic. So uh, I think that's why he's using the English horn here. Again, it's also key to note English horn transposes down by a fifth. And in this case, he's put it in a fairly low register for the English horn. English horn shares the same register, like written register as the oboe, I'm pretty sure. should always have this handy when you are uh, working on orchestration, then you can just quickly consult and figure out if it does have the same uh, written register as the oboe. I'm pretty sure it does though. I'm gonna confirm it for myself. Reads. I'm almost there. Oh, bass flute. I just like past the bass flute play page and then I immediately ask myself, does this piece have bass flute? So yeah, it has the same um, written range as the oboe. It's, the orchestration textbook says that the low register from the B underneath middle C to the G above middle C, so this range, that range is deep, rich, and intense. Again, these are written pitches. Then mellow, reedy, and sonorous for the A to A above that, and then thin, pinched above that. So basically, once you get above the staff with the English horn, it's gonna start sounding thin and pinched. It's more mellow in the higher range inside the staff, and then deep and rich in the bottom range. So Stravinsky is actually almost exclusively in that middle, mellow range here with the English horn. He hasn't gone into that really deep, rich range of the English horn, but he's in the mellow range, just above that. So it's not thin and pinched. Again, he only has like three pitches. I think one of the reasons he might be using just three pitches is to give it this kind of simple folk-like vibe. That could be also another reason that the uh, bassoon solo only had basically four pitches. There's, I think there's a fifth because it goes up to the high D, but small amount of pitch content to give it that sense that this is a simple folk melody and then he's creating complexity through uh, the rhythms that he's composing and also the interaction of parts. This, uh, it feels very like, like a bimodal or polymodal where there's just like, a, everyone is playing kind of in their own mode and it all just kind of comes together in this big mush. So you see this idea, we have this, I'll circle this as an idea. And then it comes back to the English horn solo, give it a different color. Uh, sorry, it comes back to the bassoon solo, not English horn solo. Bassoon solo, look at that. It's key to note here that the clarinet material, so on the previous page, we have this clarinet material. I'm gonna circle it in yellow. So clarinet material here, clarinet material. Then the bassoon material recurs. I actually, I really like doing this approach to score analysis, which is go through and as you go through, circle everything in specific colors. Now, the reason that this is good is because then when you look at the score visually, you can actually kind of like immediately condense all the lines down. And it's like, it's like you're building a very fast piano score. Instead of having to write out all the different lines and figure out exactly how to play them on the piano, right now I can see how these parts are in general interacting. Like, okay, Stravinsky clearly has two main lines of material that he's trying to um, 
that he's using right now. And I can see how those two things interact. I think I used red for the bassoon over here. I'm gonna use red for the bassoon again. So bassoon is here. And then bassoon finishes here. So now with this kind of analysis, I can see, okay, so he's introduced this first idea, the red idea, and then he introduces this yellow idea next, which is the clarinet idea. That kind of dovetails over into other instruments. That's probably for technical reasons, so that the clarinet players don't die. Like, <gasps> they remember these people gotta breathe, they're humans. <laughs> so they, he dovetails them over right here, and then he reintroduces the bassoon melody, and the bassoon melody continues like that. Please say, yes, I got rid of it. Aha. Okay, then we have a new idea up here, here, which is completely brand new, and we could annotate underneath this as the end of a clarinet idea that we previously had. It's almost like it, uh, and then it, yeah, it like continues out into here. This is clarinet. If I was gonna go back and contextualize the horn, I would probably say that the horn is setting up this clarinet material. And then the clarinet material almost sounds fresh because the instrumentation has been changed. Uh, so you can see then if, if we do contextualize that horn material as similar to the clarinet material, because it's very much, it's sustained and it's accompanying the solo material. It very much seems like he only has two pieces of material at the beginning. Whereas when I when you sit down to initial, initially look at this first page, it looks like a lot is going on already. But there's really only two things going on, I think. The bassoon idea, and then this accompaniment material, which eventually turns into triplet motion and kind of has the same grace note-like figures that everything else has. Then you can ask the question and you can go into these materials and pull them apart a, a little bit more in depth specifically. So you could ask the question like, how do all these materials relate to each other? It's very clear that we have two clarinet parts. So the bottom clarinet part, the clarinet in B, it's the bass clarinet, and then the A clarinet material, the first A clarinet. Those are playing parallel lines. And then above that, we have the piccolo clarinet, the E flat clarinet, and that clarinet is playing uh, a different type of line. It's almost like a gestural line. It's like the end of the bassoon solo. And I think that that kind of checks out from a reasoning perspective because here the bassoon solo ends and here this clarinet material continues. So maybe it's actually better to do analysis like this where what is actually happening is the bassoon solo discontinues and is taken by the E flat clarinet. So another strange wind and allowing the clarinets to just fill in sort of unobtrusively underneath. Then we can see that the clarinets underneath are actually just moving in a chromatic line down. I'm pretty sure they have different pitches. The first one has B flat and the second one has F. So because of that, like I'm just analyzing one of the interactions. So it looks like they're moving in parallel fourths down. Um, Please forgive me if my transpositions are all wrong. I just like try and read as many scores in C as possible and I've never practiced my transpositions. So do score reading and practice your transpositions. Don't be like me. Definitely don't be like me. <laughs> okay, I remember once one of my teachers told me a story about how he skipped basically his piano classes in university. And then he said, well, I still can't play the piano. Still terrible at it, but I didn't have to take those classes. So yeah, the, the, when you skip stuff and you don't do the work, you just end up bad at things. And it's not very satisfying. Then it takes you forever to figure out what interval the clarinets are moving in. That's, yeah, don't do it. I don't recommend it. So you can see here then that really there's only two pieces of material. There's this main melody, which is continuing. So it's almost like you could just sit down and write a theme. And then to be like Stravinsky, in this case, if you want to create this sense of two different things happening, uh, you just then write, um, a second continuation almost part that's gonna take off when the other part is kind of winding down. And that part's just chromatic and it's a falling parallel interval. In this case, fourths. I think he's going for fourths because it's not a third. Because a third sounds like traditional orchestral music. So he's using a fourth to create that sense that this is something exotic and weird. It's something that like, it's from somewhere else that we don't, we don't expect. 
So it could be useful in a mu movie score or something like that where you're trying to evoke something like an alien world or something like that. Maybe using fourths is going to be better than just parallel thirds. Parallel thirds sounds really nice, but like, does it does it evoke that quality that you want? That, that alienness, like, oh, this is really strange. I'm not sure I'm super comfortable with this. Stravinsky's great at doing that, that in this piece. Probably largely why this piece inspired a riot. Okay, then here you can actually see that this material continues. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have muted my phone. I'm gonna do that now. Shh. Okay, so we can see then that the material from the English horn just continues. And underneath that, we still have this material from the clarinets. And you can see that Stravinsky is actually being, but now it's in bassoons. So he's, this is the first moment that that clarinet material has lost the clarinet color and has gone to a different instrumental group. I usually make arrows when that happens, just so I can see. These scores get really messy. I actually did this when I had print scores. So when I was a kid, I had to, all the scores that I had to read, I had to buy. I had to order them from like a bookstore or Dover online. And then they would show up and it'd be a giant box filled with scores. And I would have saved up money for like a month and then bought all these scores. Some of my orders were like $300 open them up, take out all the scores. And I would go through and mark all these scores with like highlighter and stuff like that to go through and to try and figure out what the composers were doing. I was analyzing a lot of earlier music, uh, early romantic music, Beethoven, that kind of stuff. So this is the approach I've always taken. I, I, for me, it works really well. If you think you have a better approach, then do that. Also, I'd be super curious to hear what it is. So put it in the comments below. I'm always trying to learn and get better. I'm definitely not a perfect human. I should be viewed as no authority on any of these matters. And I don't think anyone should be viewed as an authority. We should just do the analysis ourselves and come to our own conclusions. I think that that's the most powerful way to engage with this type of art. But if it helps you watching someone else's analysis or reading someone's paper on something, then great. That's probably why the person did it was to contribute to that field of knowledge, but I'm always a little bit skeptical. Okay, so here we have English horn. This material continues. This material has now changed. You can see that he's actually added this figure, which feels very much like an elaboration of what he had done before. Like he's gone one pitch above to the D sharp and then he goes down to the G sharp, which was the previous low point. So it's almost like the D sharp is ornamenting the C and then the A is like, the A was previously there and then the B is like ornamenting the A. It's like he's added two almost like neighbor tones to the material. And then this is just creating a little bit sense of, sense of more motion uh, so that that part doesn't feel so static. Um, something I do in my music is I write a lot of angular lines. So large melodic leaps and I'm trying to work on writing a little bit more concise melodies all in one range. So here's a way to keep it interesting. Start with a small amount of pitch material so that the listener can get accustomed to the melody and the musical material, and then add a little bit more pitch material within the same register to just fill things out and make them a little bit more interesting. So I would say that then that uh, English horn motive kind of transforms into this oboe idea right here. It's like these two are connected. Because basically right at the moment that the English horn stops playing, the oboe starts playing. The oboe has different material. It's this rhythmic iteration, but the English horn and the oboe have a similar quality of sound. So we're gonna hear that oral connection. And then you can see here that actually the main bassoon figure has basically completely devolved. So bassoon one stops playing, and then we have the low bassoons. I think it's wins by four in this piece kind of wild, but we have those, the bassoons now, and they're playing this triplet figure that the clarinets previously had. Obviously it's gonna sound quite different now because it's in bassoons. And if we actually look at the interval here, it's easier to see because these are in C, we have D sharp and G, so they're moving in fourths as well. So creating that like eerie, strange quality. Let's just quickly check the, oh, I don't have the first pages. The score didn't come with the first pages. So I don't know what the full orchestra size is. Maybe it's wins by four, but I'm pretty sure it is. Like clarinet here, he's got five clarinets. So <laughs> good luck ever getting an orchestra this size. Um, yeah. Then here at four, 
we have quite a dramatic change of color, which I can see right away. So we have this clarinet doing a trill. It's saying sharp, so it's going, it's a, um, a whole tone trill. Another way to write the whole tone trill, this is more standard in uh, Hollywood scores, but you can write instead of the sharp, you can write whole tone above it, WT above it. So a program like Dorico just allows you to do that. You can set that in a preference and then it will write whole tone trills in. And then instead of whole tone, you could also write half tone. The other way of writing it is writing it with a little um, note head specifying what note you're trilling to. So that would be useful if it was like a, like a, a, a tritone trill or something like that. Uh, a program like Dorico will also allow you to do that whenever you input a trill marking, you can just set, uh, yeah. I'm a Dorico user, I highly recommend it. It's super unintuitive and there's a whole bunch of things that are really wrong with the software. Uh, specifically just intuition stuff. Like you basically have to look everything up if you wanna do it. Nothing is intuitive, but everything is extremely powerful. And I'm, I've am i personally never been a person that cares for in like intuition and that sort of thing. Like if I have to spend some time to learn the program, but the program can do everything I want, just far superior to anything else on the market, I'm gonna spend the time and learn the superior product. So that was my approach to Dorico. If you want something that's much easier to use, uh, I was gonna say use Sibelius, but I don't even know if Sibelius is easier to use. Maybe Muse score because it's free. Um, I've never used Muse score. I have no basically no opinion. I just know it's free and not as powerful. Okay, so this new gesture starts up, which is this clarinet doing this trill, and then also the horn. So the clarinet, the clarinet's in A, so it's gonna be trilling between G and A. And then the horn is also, the horn is not playing any of those pitches. <laughs> it's just playing other stuff. It's playing a G sharp even. Uh, the, D, the D sharp transposes to G sharp. And then you can see that in the, the strings, they have this pits figure. This is really common string writing. Uh, this is, comes from like Tchaikovsky and stuff like that, where you have the strings pits and as they pits up, they dovetail. And so then you can get across the entire register. I think it's Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. He has that all the time. Like there's stuff happening and then it's like boom, 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 boom. And it goes like all the way up through the gesture dovetailing. So each string instrument plays two pizzicatos and the last one is in the next string instrument. So Stravinsky is making use of that here. And we can see that this is a quintal chord. So it goes G sharp, D sharp, a sharp, and then he repeats the D sharp, but he's setting up this idea of quintal chords. So he's been using fourths in his accompaniment, and now he starts inverting that and going, okay, I'm gonna use um, quintal chords. So here, uh, I'll put it in a different color, maybe like a dark brown or something. This is, uh, this is some kind of small gesture. So this is like something that comments on the musical happenings. It's also worth, worth thinking about how it fits in contrapuntally. So, Look here at four. The English horn gesture ends right on the downbeat and then discontinues immediately with a fast duration. The next 16th note, the strings do their little woo. They like go up through that pitch material in the quintal chord. Now that's interesting because then immediately once the strings discontinue, the oboe comes in with that high D sharp. So it's like the strings connect the English horn to the oboe. That pits, the pits material connects it. Again, it's like, Try not to have any open space. You want something to sound like a melody is finished and a new thing is gonna begin, create connecting material that creates motion. At the same time, Stravinsky changes the texture. So he adds in the clarinet and the horn in these sustained pitches. Uh, I'm gonna wait to really judge all this material until I see the next page. Uh, before I decide what is the most important material, where is the main melody, that kind of thing. I think that the main idea is gonna be in the clarinet because he's marked solo. So the distinction marking solo on something, whenever you want that to be a principal material, like very important material uh, that's supposed to come through, that term is great for any winds or any brass. Uh, if you write it in a string section, then one player will play it, not the whole string section. In strings, generally, if you give them some kind of thing that sounds like melodic material, they're just gonna love it, play melodic material, and be really loud. So if you want them to play melodic material that is very soft, you gotta write like cola parta or something like that so they know like, hey, I'm supposed to play with someone else. I need to listen to someone else and, and accompany them. Okay, so we can see here that the material that he's set up 
is actually continuing onto the next page. So we have this oboe gesture, which is clearly repeated durations, then uh, sustained duration, then repeated durations, and then a sustained duration. It's likely that the oboe player will breathe at the end of the sustained duration. I think that that would, that would be how I would think of this. So as a composer, like a modern composer, you could actually decide to insert a rest at the end of every long duration, just to really make it clear that that's where they're supposed to breathe if you're concerned that they're gonna breathe during a long duration. So this is all very clearly the same material. This material I would say is of secondary importance now because it, it doesn't seem like it's super important. It's just repeated notes on, on a pitch. It's creating a little bit of rhythmic flair, but it's kind of in the background. It's moved towards the background. Then we have this clarinet idea. This is this feels like a new idea, but it feels very much derived from the previous clarinet material. If we look back, this clarinet, or the I guess the bassoon material with the grace notes, but the triplet stuff makes me think of the clarinets. But yeah, maybe it's more derived from the from the initial theme. So we have piccolo clarinet, and it's playing that. So I'm gonna put that in red then, because it seems like alluding to that initial bassoon melody. Nice. We can see here that at moments, the clarinet comes to brief rest, but other than that, it's quite perpetually in motion. Like it has a rest here, and it has a, it's kind of a long note there. It's not that long. It's like an eighth plus a triplet uh, eighth. So it's not that long. Horns are playing accompaniment underneath this with clarinets. So the horn is playing like a pad chord and the clarinet is adding some kind of uh, orchestrational interest to that chord. So clarinets and horns, I always think of them as like blending quite well. Maybe other people disagree with me. If you disagree with me, put it in the comments below. But I always think that horns and clarinets blend well together because the clarinet has this very open kind of hollow sound and the horn has a similar hollow sound, but more of the brass version. Uh, because of that, I think that they work quite well together, not muted horn, regular horn. Um, and then in this case, the clarinet has a trill. So the clarinet is kind of animating and the horns are supporting with harmonic material. You can see that Stravinsky also has access to a lot of horns. He has like eight. So he can do this thing where he does the horns two to four and then horns um, six to eight and they're playing the chord and they're just dovetailing so that they can keep that uh, that harmony, the supporting harmony, so they can keep that going throughout this section. We can see he also continues with these pizzicati figures and they're just kind of, it seems like they're sort of randomly thrown in to enliven the musical texture. You could say maybe that they're related to the oboe gesture. So right before the oboe starts each time, that material takes off. So it might be worth noting that here with like a color, like, yeah, it's like kind of oboe material. Like you can see actually, I think it is directly related to the oboe because over here as well, it stops. So when the oboe comes to a held pitch, the strings pits. Then when the oboe is about to start the repeated um, figure, the strings do the pits up to that pitch and then the oboe continues. So it's like this idea of Klangfarben melody where the melody or the idea has two different sound colors. So one plays the anacrusis, the other one plays the sustained continuation. Now Stravinsky we're gonna see does that at a lot of other places during this piece. You gotta make sure I'm doing an hour. I'm only doing an hour of analysis because I actually have to write music. So you, one thing that you can really get stuck in as a composer is just like, oh, my music's not very good. I should just like do more analysis or I should just study more theory when like really what you should be doing is just like sit down, write a lot of bad music. And then like eventually you're gonna produce something that's really good. Volume, 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 okay? Look up the Ira Glass quote, it's important. Okay, so we have to come to terms a little bit with what the bass clarinet is doing. So it's doing this like this alternation back and forth. Uh, it's in B, so it's like A flat, B flat. Obviously it's lower. <laughs> my screen is directly in front of my computer. You can see it right here, this is my screen. 
Okay, things are about to get wild. So I remember when I first looked at this as a student, I was like, I don't know how anyone ever composed that, especially without computer software. How do you hear all of this stuff? So I wanna pull it apart and figure out exactly how it was probably put together. Uh, it's key to note here that this flute is gonna do this massive, crazy, kind of chaotic figure. Because of that, Stravinsky has actually not used the flute to this point in the piece. This is something that Alan Bell talks about a lot. Uh, he's my current master supervisor. And what he talks about is this idea of reserving instruments so that when they come in to make a big gesture that like we want to hear is really important, maybe at the peak of a piece, we want the trumpet to come in and play the high note. Don't put the trumpet in eight bars before that high note. Just like you could sneak them in on a low pitch so it's easier for them to play, like a pitch an octave lower or something like that quietly sustain and grow into the texture, but really just add him for the thing that you want as the most important. Uh, so reserve the, the, the sound until the moment where you want to deliver it, then deliver all of it so that the listener can really hear that as fresh and then it directs their attention to it. Whereas if we're following the trumpet the whole time, it, it might be slightly less effective. Maybe it's okay if the trumpet has the entire melody, that's fine. Then introduce it when that melody starts, not the phrase before playing long tones or something like that. So Stravinsky's doing that here. He deploys the flute, it grabs our attention right away. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna circle this horn material. Interesting, in yellow. So you can see here that the material that I've been kind of dubbing as like background material is this triplet motion that was all in fourths. Now I'm gonna circle the horn part and it's also gonna be in yellow because I think for the next gesture, this clarinet and this horn are the accompanimental material. Very interesting that they're the previous accompanimental material discontinued. So this is really the case a lot in, in famous, amazing scores. What am I saying? In uh, scores that we consider part of the standard repertory. Those scores, they're really clear and judicial about what is the important element, what is the secondary element, what is the background element. So you usually have something that's a complemental, something that's primary and melodic, and then you have something that's just kind of adding some more depth to the texture. So there's a little bit more interest going on. You can see here that Stravinsky is doing exactly that. We have this string and oboe material. I'm actually going to delete the... Uh, I'm actually gonna delete the brown and put this in blue because I think that these gestures are actually related. I don't think there are four gestures, there are only three. The, the oboe material is like some kind of rhythmic accompaniment creating some interest. The piccolo clarinet is playing the primary material and then the horns and clarinets are playing accompanimental material. Again, Stravinsky has been extremely judicial in the instrumental combinations that are doing that. He doesn't have like one oboe playing the blue material, one oboe playing the red material, and like the English horn supporting in the harmony. Like, no. Very clearly, tone colors are reserved for specific types of material. So uh, a composer, Harry Staphylakis, said this to me once. He said, you need, like if you have three flutes, all three flutes should not be doing a different musical idea. They should all be working together doing the same musical idea. This is typically what we see in orchestration. Um, we're gonna see something like that in a couple of pages, so I hope, hope I'm gonna get there. I need to stop talking. I need to actually move forward. So this idea, well, let's just, let's just circle it like this. This idea is very clearly part of the oboe idea. It's got a plucked sound, so maybe it's a little bit similar to the sort of sharpness of the oboe sound. Then we have our accompaniment material. Which is this. And the horns. And you can see the accompaniment material goes throughout the entire passage. The secondary material, the blue material, goes throughout the entire passage. And the primary material also goes throughout the entire passage. So he's not discontinuing any of these. We could ask the question, well, we should ask the question, what is the bass clarinet doing? Why is it doing this blah, blah, blah? Is it part of the accompaniment texture or is it part of the uh, main texture or is it another secondary element just kind of sitting in here trying to create some interest for our ears? I'm gonna reserve 
judgment on that because I can't tell right now. I'm going to reserve judgment until I see the next passage because I think bass clarinet starts emerging as a primary material uh, purveyor very soon. So maybe it's kind of sneaking in early as an accompanimental texture, and then it's going to emerge as primary material very soon. Another thing would be to ask the question, like, like what pitches is it playing, and is it playing pitches that are similar to another instrument? So it's playing pitches that are, like, not really similar to any other instrument. Like, uh, I guess that, no, the A clarinet has G and A. This one has A flat and B flat, and then the horns don't have any of those pitches. I guess, no, the horn has B flat. So maybe, maybe it's a complemental material. I make that judgment based on two factors. Clarinets in this section seem to be creating background texture with the trill, uh, working with the horns to do that. So sound color is suggesting that this is probably something a complemental. And then if the horn, the low horn, which is playing the F, or that's an F sharp, I think that's an F sharp. I think my argument just fell apart. My argument just fell apart. It's an F sharp. So maybe uh, F sharp would be um, B. And I don't think that the bass clarinet is transposing in that way. Pretty sure it's German notation for pitch, which means that if you see B as a transposing instrument, they mean B flat. If you saw H, they would mean B. Okay. Things about to get wild. So it's very clear here that oboe starts doing something that lo looks reminiscent of the initial melodic material from the bassoon. So it has uh, the triplet motion with the little grace notes every once in a while. Flute is off doing something completely wild. Second flutes, uh, second flute and alto flute are doing a trill. We have horns, which are doing sustained material, but the sustained material is starting to move in the upper horns. Clarinet, excuse me, clarinets are doing this giant chromatic flourish. Bottom, uh, two of the clarinets, sorry, are doing the chromatic flourish, and the other clarinet is doing this sort of like up and down motion. I'm going to go to the next page because this page is overwhelming. So like maybe the next page will make things simpler. It doesn't, I know that. It just keeps getting crazier and crazier for a little while. So. You can see here that this is where the bass clarinet is starting to play some primary material. These huge flourishes. These really stick out in the texture because you can see contrapuntally, nothing else is happening during this space. So that's why we hear that as primary material. Everyone else's material has stopped for a moment, allows the bass clarinet to do its thing, and then someone else moves, then the bass clarinet moves. That's a great way to bring things through the texture. Just have whoever's moving be only the one person moving, no one else is moving. Everyone else sustain, one person move, everyone else, then that person sustain, then someone else moves. Great way to create counterpoint. So rhythmically offset. So this page is a little bit wild. Then this page actually does simplify. I was a little bit wrong. It simplifies slightly. And then it actually simplifies a lot here. It almost winds down. Then it gets crazy and it progressively gets crazier and crazier and crazier, as you can see. Okay, we're gonna get to that one page where there's like two bars in one page and it's just like insane. Yeah, this one of these pages. It's like, whoa, everyone's doing different things. It's crazy, so gonna eventually get there. I am gonna go through this whole piece. This, uh, this series is gonna be like 20 hours long of me just sitting here looking at the Rite of Spring score. So <laughs> hope you enjoy in-depth analysis watching someone do initial analytical processes. Okay, so uh, it's probably the case that the piccolo clarinet discontinues all entirely, it does. So it ends here. That is the end of the primary melodic material. Here, I think that we can see what Stravinsky is trying to prioritize based solely on dynamics. So this is, there are two different philosophies for writing dynamics. One, write the same dynamic for everyone and then allow people to balance appropriately based on the dynamic they're given. So I'm given a piano and I hear everyone else playing around me and I should fit into that texture because everyone's playing piano. So how do I fit in? How do I get heard, but also still fit in? 
Or the other approach to dynamics, which is like Mahler's approach, which is give everyone a specific dynamic. The dynamic is correlated directly to volume. They should play that volume so that they're heard. So like in this case, oboe play forte because you're kind of getting into your higher register. And because you're in a higher register, you're actually a weaker sounding instrument. Like you don't have a piccolo oboe. So in this case, you're not gonna stand out because you don't have an instrument that's stronger in that register. Oboe gets weaker as it moves up. So because of that, he's marked forte. He's also marked solo so that this player knows this is my moment to shine. Everyone else is secondary. So oboe here is definitely primary material. We can see that Stravinsky is using very similar primary material all the time. Triplets and grace notes. That seems to be his primary material, which was generated by the initial uh, I can't play it. Screens, screens in the way. Next time I'm gonna put my screen over here or something so that it's a little bit easier. Okay, what is everyone else doing? I would have to really listen to this to know exactly what everyone else is doing, but I think I have a decent idea of what's happening. So when I've listened to this in the past, I don't necessarily hear this flute and clarinet stuff as very important. I actually think here that what was the horn figure is starting to like emerge a little bit more from the texture because he says un peu en dehors. I can't speak French, so I'm sorry, but that means bring it out, bring this part out. We wanna hear this more. So that's starting to emerge. I think that there's kind of an inversion of the roles here. So uh, this bass clarinet stuff, we still don't really know what it is, bass clarinet, kind of just continues with the clarinets here. So this is probably, I'm gonna say this is a second, another element, I'll just put it in green for now. And then when I go back and listen to it, I'll, I'll go through and check and see, hey, is this, is this actually that material? Is it secondary material? Okay, I'm gonna circle in yellow the horn material just because it seems as if this is a continuation of the previous material and I want it to be visually linked. Definitely what the flutes are doing now is gonna be continuation of that material. And just because the flutes are being split, so we have first and second flute that are doing this wild thing, uh, you can see that they're actually alternating. So one flute is not playing all that material. One flute, flute plays the ascent, the other flute plays the descent. That allows them to have a rest, to breathe, and to not have to like focus on such wild, crazy lines. Um, also doubling flutes, just two flutes on one part that's that high, there's going to be tuning problems. So it's better to split them up unless you have a whole flute choir, which is like four plus flutes, three to four flutes to get a chorus effect. And then more than that, then it's fine. You can put lots of flutes on one part. They'll, the tuning won't be an issue because we'll have a wider pitch due to the chorus effect. So in this case, we only have two flutes doing that because he wants his uh, third and fourth flute to be doing the trill figure in the background. So he's just going to have them alternating. These flutes are decently high. It actually starts in an unideal range and then kind of sparkles up into the ideal range and then comes back down. So because of that, it's going to kind of be subsumed into the texture initially and then sparkle out and then go back in. Because of that, I think it's a secondary element uh, along with the clarinets. The clarinets here are not in their ideal register. Their ideal registers are the low register or the high register. They like those registers. This clarino register, I think it's called, no, it's not called clarino. Shall, no. I don't know what it's called. It's in the book. Consult the book. It has a name. The middle register of the clarinet just above the break, it's the weakest register of the clarinet. So they're kind of hanging out there, especially doing this like um, uh, chromatic descent. For all those reasons, I'm gonna say that Stravinsky is probably thinking about this flute and clarinet sort of busyness as secondary material. So I'm gonna do that. And again, we can see there are three materials. There's a sort of background supporting material. There is the primary melodic material, which in this case is an oboe solo. Interesting that it's an oboe solo now after a bassoon solo. So there is some similarity of tone color there. And then we have all the winds in the background that are just doing crazy stuff. It's very key to note at this point. Uh, I just realized this, but the strings have not played an arco note yet in this whole piece. This is another thing that is suggesting this sort of wildness or pagan culture. He's using a lot of wind instruments and not a lot of string instruments like the violin. Uh, if we think about the violin, at least culturally now, 
violin is associated with like high culture and uh, waltzes in Vienna and Europe and this kind of thing, right? It's very European. I would say brass instruments and uh, string instruments are most commonly associated with European culture, very much so. Uh, and the, these winds at this point, he's kind of trying to evoke that almost prairie or pastoral sound. Think about things like a, a flute or maybe bagpipes or something like that, which is used in the countryside with shepherds and that kind of thing. They're playing uh, for, their, for their herds, that sort of thing. So I think he's trying to evoke these kind of vibes. Again, Rite of Spring, it's about a pagan sacrificial dance. That's like, you can look at these things from just an orchestrational perspective, but it's also important to bring in the historical context of like, what is Stravinsky trying to express here? Okay, this page. He now writes an alto flute solo. Uh, I think that this is key. Uh, remember I said he's gonna bring in strange winds. So he's done high oboe now or high-ish oboe, mid-range oboe really. It's not high oboe, but mid-range oboe. And that mid-range oboe is the most conventional of the solos. Before that he had E flat clarinet and then before that he had high bassoon. Now he's doing alto flute solo, which is a not typical flute. It's in the lower register uh, because it has the same written range as the, or the the regular flute transposes down a fifth. And so the alto flute has this low, weird, kind of like, it's like a weirder flute quality. And then he's contrasting that with having this bass clarinet flurry. So I think that those are the primary materials. And you'll see here when I circle them, that these are written in a way that the counterpoint is just working. See? Alto flute discontinues, bass clarinet continues. Alto flute continues, bass clarinet then continues. I think it's key to note here that the English horn also has a solo. So it's hard now to tell which is actually the most important. And I'm specifically gonna go with Stravinsky's dynamics on this. If we listen to this, it might suggest which one is more important. And maybe the English horn is more important because it's a similar sound to the oboe and the bassoon. And maybe I'm gonna just like end up saying that. The English horn is probably the primary material. It has these grace note figures. It has a similar kind of contour to the original uh, mo motivic material. And this other stuff seems more like flurries kind of on the middle ground. So maybe this stuff, which is also marked as solos, in this case is actually secondary material. Kind of filling in spots. So you can see that the bass clarinet, I noted that the bass clarinet kind of takes a soloistic role later in this part of the piece. And it's key here that he actually calms down both the alto flute and the English horn to some extent when the bass clarinet is doing its big exaggerated gestures. This, uh, I remember I laughed every time I heard this when I first heard this piece. Like I was listening to it when I was like 16 or 17. And just like every time this bass clarinet is like every time it does that, I just laughed. Like it's so funny. Anyways, it's just really wild. Um, yeah, yeah, really weird. Also, it's key to note his contour in this bass clarinet thing is wild. Like it's like minor third up. Then he jumps and he does another, he does a major third, then he does a tritone, and then he goes back down. It's like, whoa, it's a weird melody, like really weird. Okay, what is everyone else doing? Funny enough, almost nothing. <laughs> like everyone else is doing almost nothing. I should actually revise this, because it's like that. Very clearly then the flutes are all together at the end of this passage. So again, we should look for context when uh, trying to determine, oh yeah, this is, bum, 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 comes in like that. Again, it comes in with a rhythmic gesture all on one pitch when the interesting pitch material is in other instruments. Then when it takes off and has interesting pitch material, the other people just sustain or discontinue, like in the case of the alto flute. Okay, so I can very clearly see what's happening here. Everyone is coming together to do one specific gesture. So we could say here that this trill gesture has been important. I'm probably gonna label that at some point and there's a little bit of accompaniment here. So like 
This material here all sounds very accompanimental. Before, these moving triplet figures have been accompanimental in the clarinets, in the bassoons then next. So now, I think that that material almost, it, it does. It comes to the forefront and becomes the main material. Again, I've also classified before the trill figure as accompanimental material, and in this case, we're gonna take that as accompanimental material. So I guess it's not an accompaniment now because it's not accompanying anything, but it does feel like the primary, like it, it, it's like the accompaniment becomes the primary material for a moment. This actually gives the sensation that some section in this work is coming to a close. So like some large section. I always get the feeling that this is like a small winding down, closing material for something before something else starts up. Because this gesture in the flute that, that takes off from there feels very much like new musical material that's just taking off and going somewhere else. And then that's confirmed when the arrival happens on the next, the next page. And we have this very complex texture. So worth noting, this is the first thing that the strings play arco, I'm pretty sure, in the entire piece. They play that trill, which everyone else has been playing. Everyone else has been playing that, and then now, finally, the strings get that gesture. Okay. That's basically it. You can see here that this discontinues. The horns and everything, they all discontinue. The accompanimental material, right when the accompanimental material becomes thinner and goes into the flutes. So he's changing it. I wanna go back and reflect on this passage. Actually, yeah, oh my gosh, I'm almost an hour. So let's go back and reflect on everything that we, we looked through today. I think that what we've seen is that while the music looks very complex and looks like there's a lot of parts happening all at once, there are rare, there are bit, there are never more than three parts in this section. There tends to be one melodic part, which features a variety of rhythms, most prominently triplets with grace notes. The grace notes throw off the sense of our triplets. We're not hearing them as ba, 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 because we're hearing ba, 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 like that kind of thing. It's just like, whoa, we don't expect that. The grace note takes rhythmic importance, so we're not feeling the pulse as easily on the triplets. Then we have accompanimental finger, figures, which are largely varied, sometimes triplets, sometimes sustained pitches, sometimes trills. Those three, jet, those three materials. And then we have secondary materials, which comment on the material in some way. I think that in general here, this uh, in English horn gesture is functioning almost like primary material. Um, I've just labeled it as secondary material because the bassoon is, is playing similar material to what it played at the beginning. And then that English horn gesture morphs into the oh gesture. Maybe here there's a fourth gesture, which is the bass clarinet. I have to listen to that to really figure out exactly how it's supposed to fit in. I have a hunch that it might be a part of the accompanimental material, um, but maybe it is another element. Then we get this kind of like flurry gesture. The clarinets actually, as the flutes become more sparse, the clarinets pick up intensity. Uh, Stravinsky does this in another texture in this piece, which is you'll have all the winds doing something and kind of interlocking together to create a complex texture, but it's all one line. And then instead of just having that one line be the chaotic texture, he adds just a chromatic descent in another wind to blur the line that they are already playing. So it's hard to like distinguish and figure out exactly what's happening. It's not like just like a... Like, okay, that's fine, that's a line, that's a nice descending kind of like trill-like line, and you could have that and want that, but if you wanna blur it so that it's not as obvious that it's like a sequence just moving down, blur it with a chromatic line, just like kind of like starting on a similar pitch and just moving across the same register that that little trilling line has. Great blurring technique to create this sense of like wonder or mystery or chaos. Chaos is also appropriate. And then he comes here and there's just one gesture, so simplifies the texture. And in simplifying the texture, he gives us the sense that the musical section is coming to an end. You can actually see here too that he's rhythmically simplifying. So there are, at the beginning, it's all triplets. Then it goes into eighth notes. Then it has some polyrhythmic complexity. And then near the end, he weeds out all of the polyrhythmic complexity. We could say that there are two gestures here that the English horn is playing a much simpler version of the original theme. 
And that might be best with the fact that the English horn is playing what looks like the primary material in the previous section. So maybe in this case, what we actually have is two things. So it's been simplified down, there are less things happening. We have this accompanimental figure, and we have this, which is part of the accompaniment. And then we have the English horn, but the English horn is now static. You can see that it's not moving. And this fact that it isn't moving gives us the sense that the section is coming to an end. So simplification of texture, one way to end. Another way to end is making the melody static so that it doesn't move. That means your melody should move and go to different pitches and that kind of thing when it's starting. I want to give some sense of variety. Anyways, I hope that this video has been really interesting. Uh, on the right of spring, we've got to rehearsal mark seven. I am going to continue through this piece until I finish the piece. I'm doing this more so that I can learn, uh, and I'm super curious about this piece, and I just want to share my thoughts on it as I go through it, and hopefully those thoughts will give you some insight into the piece and make you a better musician, theorist, or just enhance your appreciation for the piece of art that Stravinsky's put together. So thanks for watching. See you in the next video.